All right. In 2002, a few months after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, I heard for the first time in a class terms such as connected, interconnected, and globalization. Without knowing much about my purpose in life, I remember enjoying a lot the newly introduced international studies major at LaGuardia Community College by Professor Reza Fahari. His ideas always surprised me, and we had the weekly homework to be aware of what was happening in, in at least 10 countries for his class in world politics. However, there was a particular event that impacted my life forever. Professor Fahari invited our class to participate and serve the elders on a Meals on Wheels charity program on Thanksgiving in Queens. It was the first time I was doing community work, and let me tell you, that at that time, I was struggling a lot with depression. But that day, when I started serving food to the elderly, I felt a joy, an emotion in my heart that I had never felt before. Unaware of what that joy meant on that day, more than a decade passed by before I recognized that we are here to serve and work in unity for the common good. That alone, we can achieve many things, but in unity, it is way more fun. How do I end up producing documentaries if I didn't study media? When I returned to Aruba in 2007, I got the offer to manage a new TV program, and that was the beginning in the world of video production. I worked in commercial projects for some time, where I learned a lot until I decided to take the leap of faith and start contributing to my community after seeing many news related, related to juvenile pregnancy, domestic violence, drug addiction, and sexual abuse, to mention a few. Despite not having the resources and financial support, because Aruba is not an island with the resources to facilitate video productions in grand scale, I decided to obey my heart or my instinct and do what I felt was right. I founded Switch, Switch Foundation in 2011 in Aruba, and since then we have research and with the support of the NGOs of the island, we have produced educational documentaries to help prevent social issues and voice the vulnerable. We firmly believe that the switch starts in our mind with the information we consume on a daily basis. That is why in order to achieve collective behavior changes, we need to educate ourselves first by shaping our minds with positive and conscious information. That's why we decided that our contribution would be made through educational videos available free of cost digitally on our YouTube channel Switch Foundation. Schools, universities, NGOs, and the entire community will always have access to them. Our recent production, Promesa Falso, or False Promise, has subtitles in Spanish and English for the first time in order to distribute the message to the, world, to the whole world. We use an artistic image, a strategy, to capture the attention of the youth. With so much information out there, we knew that we needed to create a piece that, like a movie, will entertain to then educate. That is why it is very important to continue developing social marketing campaigns and films that incite human values such as respect, acceptance, and cordiality. I am here representing Colombia because I was born in Colombia, and I like to say that I was raised by Aruba in New York City. But I'm also representing the Latin artists and professionals, especially those from Venezuela, who believed and hold the same social vision as Switch Foundation to generate a positive change of mentality through conscious and objective education. We only have one challenge at the moment, and that in order to keep growing and helping more through our, our audiovisuals, we need to demonstrate digitally that you are seeing our work. And that is why we ask you, to please share false promise and subscribe to the YouTube channel of Switch Foundation and follow our social media platforms so that our message reaches more minds and touches more hearts. And most importantly, to help prevent that more children, women, and men keep falling into false promises. That is why today I am very grateful to share this moment with Shamir McKenzie, a survivor of sex trafficking who was invited to Aruba by the Counter Trafficking Task Force of Aruba to share her story at schools, and that's, not, and that's how her story comes to us through the organization Kiwanis Young Professionals, who requested um, for us to produce a video about human trafficking. After doing the research on the issue of human trafficking, we decided to produce an international documentary as a gift for the most vulnerable communities in the world. 
the goal is to get all the schools in Aruba, the Caribbean, and Latin America to watch the documentary. If you know of a teacher or have access to a high school, your class, help us by presenting it or organizing the viewing of the documentary. It is accessible on our YouTube, or we can also email the original file to the institution by request. Today is historical for us at Switch Foundation because it is the first time that we show the documentary here in the USA at St. Francis College, which dramatizes part of the testimony of Shamir McKenzie, a story that was adapted in Aruba. This was made possible thanks to the fact that after 15 years, the dream of seeing Professor Reza Fahari again came true. It felt as if all these years I had been preparing this documentary to show him what I had achieved achieved thanks to the impact that he made in my life by introducing me to the gift of serving others, especially the most vulnerable. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shamir McKenzie. I'm the CEO for the Sungate Foundation. And don't mind me as I'm Mike, right? We're pressed for time. Um, I'm also the ambassador for Jamaica, the anti-trafficking ambassador for Jamaica. And I co-chair the Victim Services Committee for the Maryland State Human Trafficking Task Force, traveling around the world, training and speaking and sharing my story with whomever will listen, right? If you meet me on the street and this conversation comes up, I'm going to talk to you, right? Um, so what you saw today was um, my story. That was my life. Human trafficking is not something I researched or watched on television. That was my life for 18 months. 18 months is what I describe as severe torture in every sense of the word torture, right? Human trafficking is real. It's happening right here in the United States, right? Human trafficking is an old term. It has an Italian origin, right? Trafico in Italian means commerce, right? So when you put it together, I, I get that question a lot of time, right? Where, where does the term human trafficking come from? Because before there was this hot topic of human trafficking, we were talking about white slavery, right? And the White Slavery Act, right? Back in 1904, and we had the Man Act that was implemented then that was used to address this very issue, right? But then in 2000, the United States recognized that human trafficking, as we know it today, was a problem here on U.S. soil. Right? So they implemented what's called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in the year 2000. Some of you were probably born in the year 2000, right? Right? But for me, I remember back in the year 2000, I thought everything was going to stop, right? The refrigerator was supposed to stop working. Y'all remember, right? For those of us who can't remember, right? That was the year, the TV, the refrigerator. I remember being at church at watch night service calling like, is the TV still working? Right? Y'all remember? But that's the year. The United States recognized that trafficking was a problem on our soil. And they implemented the TVPA, or the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, to address this issue. I want you to know, though, that even though they implemented the TVPA in 2000, it had nothing to do with US citizens. It only addressed foreign nationals. So that means those who were trafficked in to the US. But after being reauthorized in 2004, it then addressed U.S. citizens. Um, this TVPA has to be reauthorized every two years. It is an act. It is not law, right? So we know for acts, acts have to be reauthorized every two years, right? And so um, can you imagine, though, right? Something that as grave as that addresses the issue of human trafficking, the second largest growing crime in the world, has to be reauthorized. Right? But we do have every single state in the United States now, Hawaii being the last, last year, now have a sex trafficking law on the book. Right? Not all states have a labor trafficking law. However, my state, Maryland, I was just in, on the, in the Senate and the House last, for the last two weeks advocating for my state to implement a labor trafficking law. Right? Everyone in this room is a beneficiary of labor trafficking. Who believes that they're not? Right? Labor trafficking is the most common form of trafficking. If you go on this website called slaveryfootprints.org, you can find out how many slaves work for you today based on the everyday items that you use. I currently have 66. That's sad. Our everyday products. If you have a smartphone, the metal that allows your smartphone to place a call is mined by slave labor. We live in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a society that we demand cheap goods, right? If the shirt costs $10 and the same shirt over here costs $50, we're going with the $10 shirt, right? But 
at what cost is that shirt $10? that's at the expense of someone else's life while we can pay $10 for that shirt. I believe we also live in a society where we no longer place value on human life. That's why trafficking exists. Normally, I will ask people, what is one thing you value, right? And people will give me all the other answers except life, right? And if I was to do a test, you know, people would say, my education, my family, God, right? But that's why trafficking exists. Traffickers know that in the aggregate, as a society, we no longer place value on life. And so they exploit that. And we see it in our communities, right? When I say bachelor party, what comes to mind? I'm going to ask you again. When I say bachelor party, what comes to mind? All right, I'm going to ask you one more time. When I say bachelor party, what comes to mind? Dancing. He said, should I say stripper? <laughs> but that should tell us something about our culture, right? Like this guy, he said like strippers, like, and he's asking her like, should, should I say strippers? Like, she already said strippers. And some of you, I could see it on your faces, you wanted to say strippers, right? And that, was, that wasn't planted. I know I was here earlier, I was on a conference call for another conference, right? <laughs> that was not planted, right? But that should tell us something about our culture. How when we hear something like bachelor party that's connected to something as sacred as a marriage, our brains think strippers. Because we have all these sources of influence in our community, in our society, that desensitize us to the reality of things. We have video games that our children play, Grand Theft Auto, where in that video game you could buy a prostitute, have sex with her, pay to have sex with her, kill her, and get your money back. That's the reality I'm talking about. So when you hear a story like mine, you're like, oh my gosh, this is happening in America. But think about how society desensitized you to this. So I'm very grateful for Paula and the Switch Foundation for sharing my story so that you guys can be informed and realize there's nothing unique to me, there's nothing special about me, right? But I had this experience and I'm not gonna shut up about it. I believe that this is what I'm called to do in life, to ensure that another person doesn't have to walk in my shoe. So I will, like I said, I'll talk to anybody who wanna talk to me about it, right? We gotta be, place value on life. We gotta understand that life is important, your life is important, your life matter. Right? But here's the last thing I want to leave with you. You all have the ability to make a difference. When you see an issue, we all have a story, right? We all have a story. We all have that issue that we're passionate about. Right? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about that issue that's tugging at your heart? You can do something about it. Students, you could write articles. You could be an intern for my foundation, Sungate Foundation. I'm looking for interns. I'm looking for volunteers. Hello. Right? Last week, I told y'all I was down in the Senate and the House of Maryland. And the best thing that came out of that, not that I was down there testifying on these bills, which my voice is important, but that two pastors decide that they're going to stand up and they're going to testify before the House and the Senate on why this bill is important. They didn't have to do it. They just showed up at 11 o'clock, had their name to the list, and said, yes, we need you to support this. We need you to pass this. So you can make a difference. Look at your skills, your gifts, your talents. We have Professor, I'm going to mess his name up, so I'm not going to say it, right? Because I jack everything up. I jack my own name up at times, right? <laughs> thank you. Th th thank you, Paula. Paula said it for me, right? I know I'm going to jack it up, right? He's doing his part by bringing this film here. You could do your part by volunteering, interning, right? For the adults in the room that have certain gift, gifts. We need doctors, we need teachers, we need lawyers. Get involved. Be the change that you want to see in the world. Thank you.
like do things and numbers and stop it. So what do you think is the most like important aspect <coughs> of this all that we as a society need to tackle? In terms to the, the strip clubs or just in general? Well, just in general just in general. Well I think we need to change the mindset of our culture. Right. right? That's where it starts. Right? So if I'm going to participate and I'm going to take the strip club, for example, right. right, because people say, well, strip clubs are legal, right? If it was a problem, the government would have addressed it, right? But like you said, there's that happy ending. We know what happens in the champagne room, right? So as a man, I'm going to speak from that perspective, right? You would say, I am going to do something. I'm going to go to the club, but I'm not going to pay for sex, right? But if you don't change in your mind, the bigger picture, right? Because there is a bigger picture. It's not just going to the club and paying for sex, right? right? There's this bigger picture. So if it doesn't start here with changing your mind and speaking to your friends and people in your circle to say, hey, you know what? We're not going to the strip club anymore because why my dollars may not be paying for sex, I'm still contributing just by being in the strip club because the strip club is the facilitator that provides that platform, right? So then I'm giving the facilitator my dollars in a different way that's further contributing to the victimization of someone else. Right? So it starts by that small conversation. Like I already told my boyfriend, if we gonna get married, boo, think about where that bachelor party gonna be at or is you gonna face my hammer, right? Great question, and thank you for your comments. Yes. I have a question. As Kelly, you're a survivor, and many people don't. They don't get to survive their ordeal. So um, how were you able to survive? Could you please actually continue the story that you showed in the documentary, so the ending, happy ending? <laughs> we would like to hear, uh, listen to that. Thank you for your uh, comments and your question. I'm not a survivor because we're all surviving something, right? I'm not a victim because I'm no longer enslaved. I'm not a survivor because we're all surviving something. I'm a liberator, one who was broken free from the chains of her past, and I'm determined to make a difference. I'm determined to leave my legacy in this world, making it a better place than I saw it, right? Um, this, was not, this has not always been the place that I've been in. For the first five years when I exited trafficking, this was my little secret, and I wasn't going to tell anybody what happened to me, right? Because I was still dealing with the shame and the guilt, right, and the blame. This is my fault, right? And some people say, oh, I've been in Aruba, where one guy said, you were dumb before he got to the end of the story. I was dumb for going with the trafficker. But he didn't tell me he was going to beat me, rape me, and abuse me, right? He's talking about helping me for school. So that is the word on which I went with this man, not to get involved in this, right? And so when you come out of that and you see how people just respond to like prostitution in general, before I came here today, I was at City Hall protesting against legalizing prostitution, right? And it's like, really, we're, we're in this, this space and this time and so you have all of that when some victims are transitioning into that survivor space. We have all that thoughts. What is somebody going to say? What are people, how are people going to respond to me? Are they going to call me the prostitute? Or are they going to call me, you know? And so I had to deal with all of that internally. So the only reason why, I'm, two reasons why I'm able to stand before you today, my faith in Jesus Christ, which I'm unapologetic about. So that's number one. And then number two is a lot of counseling because my trauma didn't start here. My trauma started at six years old when I was sexually molested by a family friend. And I hadn't unpacked that. And because that trauma was still present, I was susceptible to being trafficked, right? And so trauma is real. It impacts us as people differently, right? So you may see, and for the people who are in school, I was a college student like many of you. And in school, you know, we call certain girls thoughts, right? Let's be real. Oh, that's the thought on campus. And sometimes it starts even before we got to college, in high school. But why is she a thought? Could it be that she's being abused at home and so she's normalizing her behavior to, you know, um, push down her, her, her shame and guilt, right? So let's think about those things. 
And so that's how I'm able to like unpack all of that. And I'm still unpacking, right? I'm still unpacking, but um, over the years, I've really got involved in the movement, worked on policy, training. Um, I wrote a residential program in Baltimore for adult women. Um, so it's a 90 day program. Um, you know, like I said, I was in here before on a conference call for another conference and before I was down at City Hall. So I get involved because I know that I can't point fingers at somebody else. This is not a Donald Trump problem. This is not a law enforcement problem. It's my problem. And change starts with me. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're such an inspiring, compelling person. And, Thank you. and you as well uh, did a great job capturing our story. So I want to thank you both for your time and your presence here. I'm the director of the Career Center. And you mentioned internships, so of course, <laughs> um, part of my role is to help students connect with great opportunities for organizations <coughs> such as your own. And we have a lot of students studying sociology, psychology, or, or Thank you. Intercultural um, studies, so I know would greatly benefit from working under your leadership and you know committing to such a powerful cause. So thank you for coming. To this. <laughs> I'm going to pass. I guess I'll, I'll just take a couple from my office and I'll sit around. In fact, my student assistant is studying sociology and is graduating next year. So I think this would be a great opportunity because I see you have so much passion and love for what you do, and you're making a difference both of you, and I'm so grateful to you for organizing this. Thanks, Naomi. So, students, more questions? Don't be shy. Yes, yes. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that the law only protected people that were coming into the United States, right? Why do you think that is? Like, why is the United States not viewed as more of, like, a space to watch, I guess? Well, it's changed now, okay. right? So it now addresses um, U.S. citizens. Right, but you can go on the, the State Department's website each year, the State Department around June, uh, around June 19th for Juneteenth, right? Um, they release a report um, called the TIP report where they uh, analyze and grade 164 different countries, right, in three areas prosecution, prevention, and protection. And there's a fourth P that they try to add, but you know, in the movement, we call it the three Ps, right? And so the U.S. always gets a good grade, which other countries, you know, we're like, how can the U.S. grade themselves for one? Like, I can understand it because when you understand policy, is the U.S. providing protection? Are they prosecuting? Is there prevention efforts? Yes, right? But people want to see it at a larger scale, <laughs> right? So there's still a lot of work to do, like, we have put a dent in 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 at is in terms of addressing this, but there's still so much that you can do that I can do. Just remember, um, I I'm believe it sure was last was year. Uh, there were some shots that were busted in Brooklyn that involved human trafficking and sex. Just in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and the person that was warning that was either a former cop or you know whatever many houses uh, uh, by uh, close to Sunset Park. And also, if you have been paying attention to the news, there was the case of this gentleman who is the owner of this big uh, uh, in Florida that was frequenting a spa spot, and uh, and that involved uh, uh, human trafficking and you know what he called happy endings, things like that. But he was the owner of the, the Patriots, Robert Kraft. Yeah. Um, so it is not that remote. It is happening here. Um, I don't know what the statistics are about uh, human trafficking and exploitation in the U.S., but it is tremendous. Well, we don't really have hard numbers on that, right? Because this is an underground issue, right? So you can't really say in the U.S. it's that many people. But what we do know, it's a $150 billion business, and that does not include sex trafficking because you can't quantify sex, right? So that number only addresses labor trafficking. Hence why labor trafficking is the larger of them all, yes. I'm, in, I'm intrigued. You, you said it was 18 months. How did you eventually get out? Like, that's the part. Great question. A question I get all the time. Um, escape, 
I want to say escape from the beginning, as you can see in the film, right? Um, but when you are threatened with fear, right, and then when you have to comply to survive, like, is escape really your reality? Will that ever be your reality? Um, so the first time I ran away, my punishment when I came back was being sodomized, right? And he, I was told, I was on the phone with him, and he's like, I'm in front of your house, and if you don't come back, I'm going in to kill your mother and your grandmother. And if anybody who really loves their family, you're, and, and, and in, this, in that mindset that you're in, you're thinking, I got myself into this situation, so my mother and my grandmother shouldn't have to pay for that, so I came back, <coughs> right? Um, I tried running away other times. I tried poisoning his food, right? Until I got to Florida, and I met up with these Jamaican gangsters, and you know, thinking, you know, they're really bad guys. The government of, of Jamaica to this day still can't control them. The U U.S. extradited one of their big leaders a couple of years ago, right? So when I got up with that gang, I'm like, they're the real deal. Let me see you fight these guys. And I trusted that gang leader to tell him. And of course, you know, I remember every Sunday school lesson when it was time to carry out the act. And so I couldn't punch in the code to get into the community to go and kill him. The plan was to rob him and kill him. So I figured if I stopped making him money, he wouldn't want me anymore. And that plan really didn't work because I got beat up for that. And I had an encounter with his gun before. So after that whole situation, when he brought me back to the house, Prior to this day, I wanted to die. I felt death was the only way out, right? And so any other moment, I would tell him to kill me. Go ahead, kill me. And on one occasion, he said, you want to die? All right, open your mouth. And he put a gun in my mouth and pulled the trigger. Luckily, the gun was unloaded. So on that particular day, when I heard him upstairs and I heard the sound of him loading the gun, something inside me did not want to die that day. Something inside me said, run. And I was running around in this gated community where we were living in Florida, and somebody saw me. He was a guy, a neighbor in his garage with a two-year-old daughter. And he's like, what are you doing running around here? And do you think I said, I'm running for my pimp or my trafficker who's trying to beat me up? No. I said, I'm running for my boyfriend. Because you're programmed to tell people you know, what to say if someone reaches out. So even in that state of running for my life, I'm not saying, help. And victims don't say, help, right? That's not common, right? And so that guy helped me get out. And the story continues, right? So it doesn't stop here, right? So as a direct result of my victimization, I have a felony because our system in the US still criminalize victims, right? Like one of the, 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 the laws I was testifying on, the bills I was testifying in Maryland is vacature. Like we are living in a society where someone was victimized at the hand of somebody else and they're criminalized. And my biggest opponent in Maryland, should I call their name? We're still early. Yes, I'm going to call it. It's the Maryland State's Attorney Association. Right? That guy is standing up in the courtroom. And I waited three hours for him last Thursday. And I call him, you are a good trafficker. Because what you're saying to me is I should be victimized and charged. And then now you have the power to determine my future by still holding that legal, like we cannot fix a social problem with a criminal justice response. That's not the answer. Locking people up, criminalizing the victims, and that's on a state level. So in the US, we have 36 states that have a vacature law, right? That's saying these victims should not have been criminalized. Only four states have a comprehensive vacature law. Comprehensive meaning for crimes outside of prostitution. On a federal level, we have nothing. Senator Gillibrand out of New York introduced the federal vacature law back in 2016, I believe. Under this current climate, under this administration, we know we will not get it passed. So we have the federal vacature bill sitting until this administration gets out. All right? So, Paulo, um, as you have shown this uh, video in, uh, in Latin America and Central America, uh, what has been the response from the impact? Uh, and you think that this is uh, hopefully preventing, educating and preventing uh, uh, this kind of exploitative uh, practice? Well, we just premiere the documentary in Aruba last year, October. But since we are a non-subsidized NGO, 
it's just it takes hours so we are now going to develop a distribution plan so that we can go to schools and show it mainly now to many students who are going to Holland and they leave the comfort zone they leave the warm of their parents and they go to a country which is filled with lover boys so um, I am sure that in Aruba like many other countries they, we believe that it doesn't happen in Aruba, and Aruba was graded well, uh, number one, that Aruba is doing sufficient to combat human trafficking, so we have to keep it that way. However, as she said, it's an, it is an underground business, and I am sure with the situation in Venezuela right now, we have a very large influx of Venezuelans coming in, and I'm sure they are being exploited right now, especially um, in labor so we cannot really tell the numbers but the only way is to show this information so that we as a community can open up the eyes especially with children so we can start shaping their minds and making them aware so that if they are seeing something that doesn't look right or feel right that they can speak up i have a lot of trust in children mm -hmm. so um Arubo is part of the kingdom of holland or the netherlands so it was a former colony of the Netherlands. That's, I just wanted to give you that geographic uh, point. And with regard to Venezuela, because of the desperate situation, it's almost a failed state. You have had more than 3.2 million people <coughs> emigrating out of Venezuela. And the poor people have lost elect electricity for the past two days. It's really dire situation. This is one of the richest countries in terms of oil collapsing to uh, near poverty, and we have some friends there, including uh, Paulo, and more than a million of them have gone to Colombia, but they have become, some of them, subject to uh, human trafficking and yeah. sexual abuse. Many of the, the artists who work here, they're mainly from Venezuela, and they're also friends, and I work with them digitally. They, some of them are in Venezuela, some of them are in Argentina and Colombia. And I tried working with many Aruban locals, and I guess it's the upbringing. You don't really feel what it is to live in a country with so many social issues. So when I reach out to, uh, to professionals from Latin countries, they immediately click with me. They, they get it. I don't really have to persuade. So that was, since I didn't study um, uh, production, I also had to learn a lot about instinct. And you don't, don't not don't you only need uh, a filmmaker, but you need a filmmaker with the heart, who also believes in education, who also has your same vision. Otherwise, it's going to become very commercial, and they will be complaining about the hours, the budgeting. So it, it's been a it's been a, a, a challenge, especially because we don't really get subsidy in Aruba for big productions. It's it's a touristic island. So being here is, is, for me being here, that's the main objective, to go to schools, to go to universities, for you to help to share the information. So for me being here is like being at, being at the Oscars. <laughs> so, for me, uh, um, so after this education provided to our students, if they want to have agency and be active uh, and do their part in terms of writing to their elected officials mm -hmm. or telling their friends and family members and neighbors uh, or letter writing uh, or forming a club here. Well, actually, we have club that, uh, that could take up this project. Uh, what are some of the venues or avenues for uh, you know, activism that you can recommend to our students? So I used to work for an agency called Shared Hope International, and on sh oh sorry, I used to work for an agency called Shared Hope International, and um, on their website, Shared Hope grades the 50 states, including Washington D.C., on their laws as it relates to children, and they craft a letter that you can just sign your name to and send to your to your. Um, you're a respected legislator, right? And so all you would have to do is put in your name, your state, and you can see, you know, like right now, I know Maryland is in session. I'm not sure if New York, if this is your legislative session is open now, I'm not sure. Well, yes, it is, because y'all have this decriminalization, legalization of prostitution thing going on right now, right? Um, but you could go on there and see what bills are introduced into your state right now and send letters to your legislators just by signing your name. So it's already drafted for you. So you don't have to sit and try to think of, what words do I say that's gonna really 
right? It's already drafted, right? And then there are local organizations here in, in New York that, that work on this issue. I know ECPACT USA, um, they are here in New York, um, and ECPACT started working on this issue from the UN, crafted their protocol around this issue. Um, ECPACT, they train hotel and airlines. They have this thing called the code, that when they train the hotels, they give them the symbol to say that this hotel is not gonna participate. So they have like a plaque on their wall called the code. So, and that's basically honoring saying, we went to this training and we're not going to, you know, uphold trafficking on our premises. So. Wait, so if you go to Switch Foundation Aruba, you'll get Paulo's foundation and your foundation? Or is Sungate Foundation. Uh, and what is the website for it? Sun-gate.org.